Louis, thank you for a, a sweet time of worship. You know, they talk about people having southern accents and then deep south accents, and that's ultra south accent. You say you're way down there, but we appreciate you very much. Glad you could be here. How many years have you been coming here now? Probably 10? Yeah, off and on. Some of you who are newer, he's been here several times over the years, and just appreciate Louis and his wife very much. Let's pray before we start the teaching. Lord, we do ask that your Holy Spirit would be here to speak to each one of us, just where we are in our journey and walking with you, that you would speak to our hearts. As we walk through this topic of healing, Lord, that you would give us wisdom and understanding and guidance. We do pray against any spirit of Satan that would try to bring confusion or deception. We just ask for your Holy Spirit to rule and reign here in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I have been talking about healing for several weeks, and um, for most of the last couple of weeks, we've been in James chapter 5, in this part where it says, is any one of you in trouble, he should pray, if he's happy, he should sing songs, and if he is sick, he should call the elders and ask the church to pray over him and to anoint him and pray in the name of Jesus. And we talked there about the importance of asking others to pray with you and calling upon those who are mature in their faith, who, who have belief and have hope and faith, and that they come and pray with you, that there's something in obedience about this. And we've been walking rather slowly through this process because I think there is a lot of confusion, uncertainty, sometimes hurt and pain associated with the subject of healing. And yet, at the same time, we believe God still heals. And so in the scripture, it says that we are to pray in the name of the Lord, and that is in the name of Jesus. And really, his name is that which is above all names, and it is by the authority that he delegates to any of us that we could pray and that we could ask for healing. And the scripture says the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise him up. We spent most of our time last week talking about that particular uh, sentence, because there is this reality that we must come to him in faith and ask. But at the same time, the scripture says that it is the Lord who will raise him up. That there is this interaction between our faith and his work, his power. It's like I was talking last week about the woman who had the bleeding problem. That she came and she thought, if I could just touch him, that he, then I would be healed. And so, in fact, she did. And Jesus said, power has gone out from me. He knew immediately that something had occurred. And then he spoke to her. He, he first asked to say, who was this that touched me? And remember, there was a big crowd around him, and, and his disciples were like, Lord, there are many people touching you. How could we identify one? And he said, no, there was one who touched me in a special way. And he knew that this healing power had touched her. And, and he said, look, your faith has healed you. And see, there's the interaction there between her faith, her desire to be healed, and the power of God interacting through her faith to bring healing. I said, I think when I taught on this uh, some time ago, that, that her faith opened the door for the power of God to come upon her. So it wasn't her faith that healed her by itself, not faith alone. It's faith in him opening the door for his power to come and bring healing. And so this is what the scripture here, I think, is also saying, that the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, but it is Christ, the Lord, who is the one who raises him up, who has the power to bring this healing. Now, but Jeff, I think I'm just a little loud. Do I sound a little loud to you guys? It is to me, just a little bit. Now, let us continue in talking about this because last week we talked about this thing about unbelief. We looked at the scripture where in Jesus' hometown it says that he couldn't do many miracles there because of the lack of faith of people. That they saw him as just an ordinary person and how could it be that he could do anything supernatural or be a person who was truly used of God. And, and I joked, but I said it, said it with really meaning that people in my hometown would have the same scoff that I could even be a pastor. And I, I really understand that because it amazes me at times too. But you see, there is this reality in his hometown that they just didn't have faith that he was the one who had the supernatural power. And so there was this inhibition in regard to the miracles that he could do because of this lack of faith. Yet at the same time, we walked through this scripture last week where um, there was the gentleman who had a son who he had a spirit that made him deaf and mute and so forth. 
And the spirit had tried to kill him, the scripture indicates, and, and the man had brought the son to the disciples and asked them to drive it out, and they couldn't. And yet when he spoke with Jesus, he said, if you could please, if you could do anything, would you please help? And then Jesus posed the rhetorical question, if I could, so to speak. He was saying, look, everything is possible for him who believes. And in this particular situation, Jesus went on and delivered the boy from this and healed him completely from this problem. But you see what the father said? He said, look, I do believe. I do have faith. That's why I've come to you. Help my unbelief. And I think there's something very important to understand there. That here's a person who had enough faith to ask. He had enough faith to come to Christ. And his hope was in Christ. But at the same time, he recognized that he didn't have perfect faith. Or he didn't have perfect belief. And he had doubts. And he was like, Lord, help me. I believe, but help my unbelief. And as I said last week, you know, if Jesus was waiting for him to have perfect faith, then he would have done what? He would have said, look. Go back and work on your faith, and when you have it perfected, come back, and then I'll heal your son. He didn't say that at all. He didn't rebuke him for having unbelief. He healed the boy. And what do you think that did to the man's unbelief? That was a pretty good fixture, I would say, to his problem of unbelief when he saw the boy healed completely. And in fact, the scripture indicates that he'd been that way since childhood, so probably for many years. So I'm sure that dad's faith catapulted when he saw this miracle that Jesus wrought in this particular situation. But then we went on a little bit. And in the same passage, it's talking about where the disciples asked Jesus, he said, why couldn't we drive it out? And uh, he said to them, well, it was because you had such little faith. In, a, in another part of the scripture, it says, because you, this one must be driven out by prayer and fasting, some translations say. And then Jesus told them, he said, now look, if you have just a little faith, that's all it takes to move mountains. And as I said last week, Jesus didn't rebuke them for their lack of faith. He didn't say, look, I'm going to get rid of you. I've got to get a whole new dozen here to work on because they'll have more faith. Instead, he did what? He let them come to the end of their human faith, and then he imparted to them supernatural faith. You know, at the point that Jesus was arrested and crucified, don't you suppose that their flesh faith came to its wit's end? That they, all this hope they had in Jesus, and they were probably thinking, we saw him do miracles. How could it be that he's now crucified by the Romans and the Jews? And yet, I'm sure their flesh was trembling. We know that Peter was in fear when he denied Christ. But then what happened when they saw first the resurrection, and then Jesus speaking to them, he appeared to them, and then he said, wait, and he would send them the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. He gave them power from on high, and at Pentecost, what he was doing was giving them his faith, his supernatural power, to believe beyond what they could believe in their own flesh. And that's what was going on, that he was imparting to them faith. And see, I emphasized strongly last week about salvation because salvation, according to Ephesians, comes by faith but not of works, that faith is a gift from God so that no man can boast in his faith and say, I'm saved because I have such great faith. And if faith is a gift from God... And it is something that he works in us for salvation. I believe faith for healing is also a gift from God. That it's his spirit working in us to have the belief, the faith, that to come to him and believe that he can work in us according to his plans and purposes. You see, I don't believe that faith is something that we conjure up. However... I do believe there is this mystery, the interaction between God's Spirit and our will, and that our will can stand in unbelief, like the people in Jesus' hometown. That if I stand in unbelief and I stand with sort of a determined attitude of a lack of faith, that becomes a hindrance or a barrier to the work of the Spirit in me. But as I believe and as I submit to myself, His Spirit working in me will impart to me more faith. And the point that I made last week, and I think it bears repeating not only this second week, but over and over and over, 
If you think about your own life, if you have walked with Christ for a number of years, even if it's only been one or two years, has your faith increased? Well, it should have over time. I I certainly believe that my faith and trust in Christ is far stronger than it was decades ago. But the question then is, who increased your faith? Was it you who conjured up deeper faith over the years and said, look at what I have done? Or was it Christ who was building faith in you along this journey, giving you this strength of conviction and hope in him? Well, I'm convinced, at least for me personally, I can't speak for you, but for me personally, my increase in faith is 100% him. And the only thing I have done is cooperate. In other words, I haven't conjured up or built my own faith. I have desired to know him. I have desired that he would do more. And he is the one who has built my faith along this journey. And probably most often the way that he has built it is by taking me into the circumstances that I probably would have preferred to avoid. Challenges and difficulties that I'm like, Lord, couldn't I just like go watch a baseball game instead of go through this today? But instead, it's tough. But in those tough times, he is the one who's building our faith, perfecting us, making us more like Christ. So now this week, I'm just continuing and talking about this because we were talking about, well, what does it mean to have true faith to believe in healing? And the example I gave last week about this, what I think is true faith, is the example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because they were the ones who were facing imminent death, that is the prospect of being burned to death. I mean, think about that. It wasn't just some small little thing, and yet they said to this very, very powerful ruler, Nebuchadnezzar, who could have easily put them to death by his word, at least it appeared, They said to him that, look, we will not bow down to this false god that you've set up, that is a golden statue of himself. And he says, look, if we are thrown into the fire, that we serve a God who is able to deliver us from it. And yet they said, if he does not, we will still not bow down. And the reason I emphasize this so much is there is, in Christendom, particularly in the United States, the faith movement idea that you must always have conviction and and belief and you can't have any doubt. And if any doubt enters your mind, then it's not going to happen. Well, the faith movement would say when they said, even if he does not, that they have invited unbelief or lack of faith into the circumstances. And yet what happened? The scripture says that even Nebuchadnezzar recognized that there was a fourth one in the fiery furnace with them who was Christ himself, undoubtedly. And you see, I believe that this is the perfect example of faith because they said, we believe he has the power and authority to do anything, including deliver us, but if he chooses not to do so, we're still going to trust him. I really think that is utmost faith. It's not allowing doubt in. Because as I said last week, the point that I made, the strongest point I made last week, is that faith in true faith is faith in Christ, not in an outcome. And too much of the time, we think faith is proclaiming this thing that I want and then believing I will get it so strongly that God has to give it to me. I think genuine faith is trusting him that he is the one who is sovereign and who will choose. And my faith is in him alone, not in an outcome. I've had a lot of supposed faith for things that I wanted, some outcome, and begged and pleaded for those, and they didn't come about. And either my faith was too weak or God had a better plan. Inevitably, in all cases, in retrospect, I can look back and say what? God had a better plan. I mean, like I prayed for certain jobs, and I thought, oh, this is the perfect job. I want this job. I pray for that. I pray for it. I pray. Didn't get the job. Got a job that I didn't want, per se. 
Honestly, this is absolutely true. Early in my Christian life, I, I, was, I was still single, and I decided to quit the job that I had. I mean, I, I gave them notice. I was going to quit several months later. But I just felt led to go and do something different. And there was a job that I was like, this is the job I want. I was praying for it. I thought God is going to give it to me. He did not. He opened the door for another job. And as I looked at that job, I'm like, I don't want that job. I really did not want that job. Now, it had a, it had a lot of good characteristics. But there were some things about it. I'm like, oh, I don't want that job. And the reason I didn't want it is because I, I felt like I would be too caged like I wouldn't have freedom, that I would have to, and even when, it turns out I took the job that I didn't want, and I had two bosses, not one. I was super caged, right? And do you know what happened? The Lord taught me submission in that job. And I look back and think, that's what I really needed to learn. That I still had a rebellious spirit that I was carrying around with me from my pre-Christian days, and he put me in a job that I thought I didn't want that really broke me of something that I didn't need, and you know what? I liked the job. I look back at it now and think, that was a great job. So you see, I didn't conjure up enough faith to get the job I wanted. He was the one who determined. Later, I've learned not to say, Lord, I want this so much. I've learned to say, Lord, I'm, I'll trust you no matter what you choose. I don't want to choose. I'm not good at choosing. You choose. Now, let's then apply that to healing. And what I want to talk about this week, maybe if we get there, is um, what I call hindrances to healing. Now, I started to entitle this Barriers to Healing. And I thought about that a good bit, and purposely changed the title, okay? Because barriers to healing sounds like something that if this occurs, no way you're going to be healed. Hindrances is more like these things could slow down the process or might uh, inhibit the process, okay? So let me say this. First of all, I believe God could heal anybody, anytime, under any circumstances, no matter what barrier I put up. I mean, think about like um, uh, Naaman in the Old Testament. Remember him? He had leprosy and so forth, and he wanted to be healed. And so they sent him finally to the prophet who told him to do what? Go and dip in the Jordan seven times. And what about him? What did he say? Initially, he was what? He was mad. Why was he mad? He said, why would I have to go dip in that stupid Jordan River? Is basically what he was saying. Aren't there better rivers here in the homeland where he lived? He was like, huh, I'm not going to do it. And one of his wise servants said, look, don't you think you ought to just give it a shot? I mean, if they told you to do something really difficult, you would have done it. Just, just go dip in the river and see what happens. Right? What happened to him? He was healed. Now, did he have bold, strong faith? He was mad. He was like, I don't want to do that. And what happened? God healed him anyway. Now, so that's why I say I didn't call this barriers to healing because, look, you could be lost. You could be angry at God. And in his infinite wisdom... He could choose to heal you in some circumstance in order to reveal himself to you. I mean, I, I have heard secondhand, I've not talked to a person firsthand, I've heard secondhand of people who were unbelievers who experienced healing. So he could do that if he wants to. So that's why I'm saying hindrances, not barriers, because he's God and he can do whatever he wants to do. Now, to explore that, though, I want to go to this scripture. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what uh, has done he did to this fig tree, and where he, he basically said he cursed it, you might say. He says, look, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Now, Jesus himself said, look, if you have faith and do not doubt. Okay? Now, sounds pretty clearly like if I'm going to ask for healing, I must have faith in what? That God will heal and that I must have zero doubt with regard to him healing. 
right? Now, maybe there is somebody who walks without ever having any doubt. But I have not personally met them. And I have been with some people who were walking in very strong faith and believing that God is going to heal and so forth, but they came to a point where their physical condition was so weak that they began to doubt. Sort of like John the Baptist. Remember, remember when John the Baptist was in prison and he sent some of his disciples to Jesus and said, ask him what? Are you the one, or should we look for somebody else? Now, remember, John the Baptist had proclaimed that he was the one. He had baptized him. He had seen the Spirit descend upon him. But then John had been arrested. He's put in prison, and he's in there going, I don't know. And he he sent his own disciples to say, go ask Jesus if he's the one, or should we look for somebody else? What had happened to him? He had begun to doubt. Ultimately, what happened to him? Well, he was beheaded. Now, those in the ultra-faith movement would say what? Because of his doubt, that's why he was beheaded. Uh, I don't think so. But now, this scripture, if you read it right clearly, it says, if you have faith and do not doubt. Now, let me look at this second scripture, and we'll come back to the question. Over in 1 John, it says this. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything... According to his will, he hears us. And we know that he hears us. Whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. Okay? Now, to me, this is the critical scripture that balances other parts of scripture. This is why it's not a really wise idea to take a single scripture and build a little theology off of that single scripture. You've got to balance it with all of the rest of scripture. And what does the rest of scripture say about this particular aspect? And because if you go back to the scripture we look at it for, there, it says, if you have faith and do not doubt. Okay, if I have faith about a job or whatever it is and I don't doubt, I can get that, right? Well, not if what? It's not God's will. So there is this question of, I must have faith, I must not doubt, but my faith must be in him. You see, if it's in an outcome that I am projecting, am I going to be wrong some of the time? Well, I am. No matter how much faith I have and no matter whether I don't doubt or not, it's just not going to come about. But if my, if my certainty is in him, it's sort of like this. Let's say you lost your job. You've had a job. It's a good job for a long time. Let's say the company shut down your department. I, I knew a guy who this happened to him twice. He worked for Raytheon up here. Some of you remember when Raytheon had a big operation in Bristol. He worked there, and, of course, that went down, and he lost his job there, and he got another job with another company, and and they shut down the department he was in. See, both times it had nothing to do with his skills or his job performance. It was the company itself. But now let's say this happened to you, all right? Now, at the moment you lost your job, obviously that's going to be a difficult thing, right? Can you have complete faith in Christ and not doubt that he will provide? Yes, you can. Can you have complete faith and not doubt in the means by which he will provide? In other words, can you know exactly what job he's going to do and how he's going to meet your needs and all those kinds of things? I don't think so. See, I don't think you can know the future and predict and therefore say this is how it's going to happen. But what you can know with absolute certainty is that he will not forsake you. He will provide for you. He will not leave you. He will, in fact, he will surprise you with how much he will will meet your need. Do you see the difference, though? In one case, I'm saying he's going to meet my need by doing this. In other words, this is the outcome that I project. I have faith in that. This is what he's going to do. The other is I have faith in him. And you see, there is a difference. It's the same in healing in my mind. Now, some people would say I'm wrong. I told you this last week. There are people who would disagree with what I'm teaching about healing. But you see, if your faith is in him, you can have absolute certainty and no doubt that he is the one who's sovereign who will do that which is good. He has the power to heal. He will heal if it is his will for you in this circumstance. Now, so we go back to this question. It's about, well... It says, anything according to his will. All right? Now, 
And this raises a whole spectrum of questions, okay? Perhaps one of the more difficult parts of this whole subject of healing is right here, all right? Because this question is, is it God's will, will to heal in every circumstance? Okay? Is it God's will to heal in every circumstance? All right, now, remember early in this teaching, I told you that now there's some people who do not believe in miracles at all today. That, that they, they would say they're Christians, but they don't believe that God does anything supernatural today, no healing, anything like that. We shouldn't ask for or expect anything supernatural, okay? And then there are some who would say, well, God himself still heals, but he doesn't use the gift of healing through people anymore. So there are no apostles or disciples, anybody who has a supernatural gift of healing. Only God himself could supernaturally heal, and, and he does that wherever he desires, essentially randomly, you might say. Random is not the right term, but in other words, he does it according to how he desires, but not necessarily in every circumstance, okay? So those people would be the cessationist category who would say God himself could still heal, but there are no supernatural gifts of healing, okay? Now, if you're over in that category, you would say what? The first category, you'd say what about healing? Well, it's not God's will to heal today supernaturally. That if there's going to be any healing that takes place, it's through your body naturally or through medical means or something like that. The, the cessationists would say it's not God's will to heal through the gift of healing. We shouldn't expect that. And again, you know, if it's going to happen, well, it could happen by God's sovereignty. All right? Now, as I said before, as a church, that's not where we stand. We, just, we believe that God still heals. Okay? But if that's one end of the spectrum, we could go all the way over to another end of the spectrum. And that end of the spectrum says what? That it is always God's will to heal. Okay? Now, stay with me here because if you don't, some of you, depending on your background, may get mad at me, okay? But, but stay with me. Now, those who would say that it is always God's will to heal would say that healing is in the atonement. The atonement is the work of Christ on the cross, his shed blood, his broken body for us that atones for what? Our sin. And you could go all the way back to Isaiah, the scripture that talks about that he bore our iniquities and so forth, and, and that by his stripes we are healed. And then there are New Testament scriptures that refer back to Isaiah. And so those who would say that it is always God's will to heal would say that healing is in the atonement, and by definition, it is always God's will to save. That is, the atonement is for the forgiveness of sin. So it's always God's will to save. And they would say it's always God's will to physically heal. Okay? Now, the, the next step with that, if a person is, if, the, if uh, salvation is in the atonement and it's always God's will to save, if a person is not saved, it is because what? Because that person resists salvation. Now, we're, we're on ground here, by the way, where theologians have argued for centuries, okay? Like, did God elect this person, and could they choose, and could they not choose, and so forth and so on. But what I would say is that, the, at least along that line, if healing is in the atonement and a person is not saved, there's something about them that resists salvation, okay? If you follow the same logic, then what would you say about healing? If healing is in the atonement, then what? Then if they're not healed, what? There's something about the person who is resisting healing. Now be careful here. This is not what I'm saying. I'm laying out just a, an ideology, okay? Now, the conclusion then, if, if you say that healing is in the atonement, then by definition, it is always God's will to heal. Then if a person is not healed, it is for what reason? Well, those who would make that argument, they would conclude that they are not healed because of their doubt, their unbelief, or their lack of faith. Okay? Now, you see, the critical question there is not the question about doubt, unbelief, and so forth. The critical question is, is it always God's will to heal? Okay? And... Now, let's go back to the idea of the atonement. 
the atonement of Christ, that is, there is, no, uh, there is no forgiveness of sins apart from the shedding of blood, that Christ is the propitiation, the substitution, the covering for our sin. What, what theologians refer to as the atonement is the work of Christ, the, the sacrifice of Christ to cover and wash away our sins. Okay? Now, so clearly, salvation, justification, purification, righteousness is in the atonement for a person who accepts Christ. Okay? Is healing, that is physical healing, also in the atonement? Here's the critical question. Yes. Now, let me explain that, though, because some of you are going, now I'm confused. You see, the atoning work of Christ, when you accept him, perfects you in Christ, correct? Therefore, you will not be subject to the second death, because what? The second death is eternal death, eternal separation from Christ. The atonement of Christ perfects us in him so that you and I now what? We are connected with him in eternity. And we have been totally forgiven. Am I perfectly pure and perfectly righteous? I am. Yes, I am. In him. Are you? Yes, you are. In him. Okay? Because of the atonement and because I have been perfected, I will receive what? A new body. Is physical healing, that is victory over death, in the atonement? It is. Because what? He is the one who has perfected us and made us holy in him. Therefore, I have eternal life with him and I will receive a new body. So, yes, physical healing ultimately is in the atonement. The big question, though, is physical healing in the atonement for the temporal world. Do you see the difference? There's no doubt whatsoever that you and I will be completely healed of this problem of sin. That in accepting Christ, it is already done. You are already perfected in him. When you die, you'll be with him. You're going to receive a new body. So you're going to have a perfect body. No more of this thing that's wasting away. You're going to have a perfect body. So physical healing is in the atonement eternally, permanently. The question is, is it in the atonement temporally? That is, in this world. That's where it gets tough. Because, you see, now look. I am perfected, you are perfected in Christ so that we are righteous and holy. When he looks at us, he sees us as holy and righteous. However, in working out my salvation, am I always holy and righteous? No. Because I'm still dealing with the effects of sin in my mind and so forth, and I'm still dealing with the problem. And see, I think... Along the same line, even though ultimately, yes, I will have a new body, I'm still dealing with the problems of sin in a fallen world and the effects upon me. So I don't know that the atonement guarantees physical healing in this world. Okay? Now look, again, I said this last week. My job, I don't think, is to force you to agree with me. That's not my goal. My goal is that we would all grow. So if you disagree, that's okay. But see now... There are those who would say, by definition, it is always God's will to heal in this world, in the temporal world. Which, if you say that, by definition, then what? If a person is not healed, the burden is where? It's upon them or some other reason outside of God. Do you see that? Now, there are many people who would say it's because they don't have enough faith, they don't believe... There are those who would say it's not the lack of faith on the part of the person being prayed for. It's a lack of faith by the person doing the praying. If it's always God's will that the person praying must have strong faith in order that the person would be healed. And if they doubt and they have unbelief, then they wouldn't be healed. Okay? Now, but, but see, that is, if you take the position that healing is in the atonement and therefore always it is God's will to heal in this world. Now, if what I said is reality, that is that ultimate healing is in the atonement, but temporal healing may not be, then 
you come to the subject of healing and you say what? I don't know whether it is always God's will to heal in this world. And in fact, you would probably say, based on the evidence that I see in this world, people die. And many people who have strong faith, who love the Lord, still die of sickness and illness. You see, if, if you believe that healing's in the atonement, it's always God's will to heal, and you always walk in faith, then what? Then you should exit this world someday, but not because you're sick or ill or anything like that, but it's just because you wore out in your time, and maybe you just were like Elijah, and you were taken up. But, but you see, if, if sickness still has the possibility of affecting us, and illness and so forth, and, and what I see in reality is what? People still die. So, and, and many people that I've been around who died of sickness and illness were people, in my mind, who had extraordinary faith. And see, now this is just where I am. You have to decide for yourself. I am not comfortable saying that temporal healing, that is healing in this world, is in the atonement and by definition it is always God's will to heal in this world. Because in saying that, then you must say if a person is not healed, it is their fault and the burden rests upon them. Now, I believe God heals, but I believe he's sovereign. That my faith must be in him and in him alone, and I will trust him for the outcome. If he chooses to heal me in this world, I accept that, I thank him for it, I move on. If he chooses to heal me by taking me to heaven, Paul said it would be better. You see, in that case, the outcome of healing is where? It's not based on my faith. I, I, I know right now I don't have enough faith. I just don't. I know. Some of the people that, I, that I have demonstrated to me the deepest faith in the most difficult, darkest hours, what happens to them? There's doubt. It's like, what happened? Where is he? Why? If, if it's based on my faith, if, if healing is contingent upon me having enough faith, I know I don't have it. But I have faith in him. That he is the one who is sovereign, that he chooses, and according to his plans and purposes, that I, I come to him, I ask, Lord, I have belief, help my unbelief. I have enough faith to believe that you can do anything you want to do. I trust you in whatever the circumstances are, and I invite you to do your supernatural work. And if that is by healing today, amen. And if it is by exiting this world and going to be with him, far better. Now, you know, I try to lay out sort of these spectrums here. There are plenty of people who would disagree with what I'm saying for different reasons. That is, whether you're on this end of the spectrum or this end of the spectrum. And I'm just telling you where I am comfortable, and that is, I believe God heals. I believe he does supernatural things. I believe he can do anything he wants to do, anytime he wants to do it. My faith is a lot stronger than it used to be, but it's still peon faith, really, compared to, really, compared to like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I believe that he is the one who is sovereign, that I can trust him no matter what the circumstance, but I cannot predict the outcome. Well, I never really got to where I was planning to go. But I better stop now. Really, point five is where I was going. That's, that was the primary part of the teaching right there. Never got there. This healing thing is really slow. and then Some people say it's because I lack faith. Otherwise, we could teach faster. Look, honestly, 
I've said to some people, this is one of the, for me personally to teach, this is about the hardest topic I think I've dealt with. I've probably spent twice as much time trying to prepare a teaching for this than any other topic I've dealt with. Because there's a lot of different belief in Christendom. And this is an area where some people have been deeply wounded. And I'm not trying to force you to believe in a certain way. I'm trying to explore this topic in order that we might all grow in belief according to truth and according to the direction of His Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, I do ask that you would guide and direct each one of us. That we would trust in you in all circumstances. That our trust would be in you as a God who loves and who blesses. That you desire that your children come to you in faith and then you pour out your love upon us. Lord, teach us to have wisdom and guidance and balance, knowing that unbelief is a hindrance, but at the same time, you are the one who is sovereign over all things. I just pray for your spirit to rule and reign among us. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.